Why do teachers fail students? Do they fail? Is it the system, or is it something in the students, or is it something all in the wash? Well, I think that sometimes teachers really do fail students, and one answer might be because they have no reliable way of knowing what really works. Now sure, we've all got stories about teachers who inspired us, but at the end of the day, they are just stories. Life is super complicated, and it's very difficult to pin any one skill that you have on any one teacher. Now, how exactly to measure the value of teaching in this reality without falling into the tyranny of metrics that would make any reasonable teacher throw their hands up in the air and give up? This is a very interesting topic, one that certainly would help more teachers and students succeed in ways that are predictable and therefore reliable. Now, although I never thought about this topic in quite the same way as John Danaher, I was very, very grateful because I'm interested in this topic and he wrote an article that was very enthralling called The Trouble with Teaching. Is teaching a meaningful job? You'll find the link to that down below. Now, the point of the article is not to say that teaching has no meaning. It's rather to think deeply about what meaning is and how a lack of measurability impacts everything and everyone across the board. Now, meaning is also a topic that comes up a lot in John's book, Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work. Wouldn't that be something? Well, we get into a little bit of that topic, all while reflecting on the future of education, both online and in how one educates oneself. I hope you'll find this conversation as impactful as I did. I think in particular, the clues for how students can help their teachers improve with substantial feedback that actually matters is especially useful for those of you in school, or even those of you who, like me, are lifelong learners constantly milking what the current utopia of automation provides us through the majesty of our current robot overlords and algorithms. And go ahead and please read that article. John's an amazing writer, and how he reflects on developing his writing skills and developing his expertise in philosophy, given this problem of meaning in teaching, it also holds fascinating clues to learn and be inspired from. And let us know what you think. Hit that thumbs up as always, so those robot overlords know that humans still care about memory and learning. And if you're new here, get subscribed for the utopia of learning, meaning, and growing together, always yet to come. John, thanks so much for joining me on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast. I'm excited to speak with you precisely because very few people, if ever, have ever talked about the meaninglessness, let's say, of the profession of teaching. And so I'm kind of just excited to, to dive deeper into what led you to think about that and how it connects with you know your, your book, which I was able to read and... Um, it seems like it has many, many connections that you didn't qu totally connect in, in, in that article that you wrote. So who's John Danaher and how do you come to, you know, huh. preach the good news about the meaninglessness of teaching? Yeah, well, we might come back to that. I, I don't think I quite argue that teaching is meaningless. Right. I think it's just that maybe it's uh, people often single their teaching as being a particularly kind of noble or meaningful profession. And I think it's maybe less meaningful and more frustrating than people let on like, apart from teachers who are often kind of intimately familiar with the institutional and kind of personal problems that arise from teaching so i mean in terms of who i am i'm a i i'm a university academic um i work in a university in ireland the national university of ireland in galway and i teach in a law school although my research is primarily in the ethics of emerging technologies so i've written a, a book about automation and work uh, and meaningful work and human flourishing outside of work and i also author a blog called philosophical disquisitions where i explore you know a kind of fairly eclectic set of philosophical themes and and i write about things that i experience in my own life so, so the piece that i guess we're gathered here today to discuss is uh, something I just wrote at the end of this academic year that we just finished up our academic year here in Ireland and I wrote a piece about the meaningfulness of teaching and I, I guess it, it has a question in its title is is teaching a meaningful job um, and I, I kind of critique or complain a bit about uh, teaching as a meaningful job. 
I apologize. I didn't mean to shoehorn meaninglessness in it in quite that way. Um, but what got me ex- excited about that whole notion was, you know, you kind of highlight the fact that it's about students and uh, the students are going to succeed based on metrics that have no measurement, so to speak, that, that, that you could discern or you were talking about, you know, a sort of frustration or inability to even know the impact or how to even measure it if there is one. Yeah, so I think that, that's a good way of putting it. So, like, you know, a, a typical way of thinking about wh- whether teaching is meaningful to say, well, it's meaningful because it allows students to achieve certain goals that are positive for them. They acquire some kind of knowledge or skill that's useful to them in their lives in some way. I guess oftentimes we can think about this in terms of access to employment and opportunities. But even if you're kind of less instrumental and economic in your orientation, you'd say, well, they're you know, they're getting a better sense of themselves in the world, they're gaining understanding of the world, and these are all positive things. And I think, you know, while I might push back against that somewhat, I think in, in principle, I'm willing to accept the notion that teaching is meaningful if it achieves these kinds of ends. But I think my problem with teaching is, uh, as I would put it, an, an ep- epistemic critique, as, as that's a philosophical way of putting it, which is that I don't really know whether a teaching, or my teaching in particular, ever achieves those ends. Right. Um, and I, I guess that's one kind of major source of frustration or uncertainty about the meaningfulness of teaching. So does that then somehow, I don't know what the right word, but threaten or violate or reduce your ability to, to flourish? Um, the, the notion of flourishing comes up in uh, automation and utopia. So uh, maybe... I don't know if there's nuance in how you think about flourishing, if you're thinking of the eudaimonia, or how you say it, eudaimonia. Um, yeah, eudaimonia, eudaimonia, yeah. Sure. Eudaimonia. Um, you know, it, it's quite a nuanced and rich sort of so, sort of notion. And I guess one way I would think about it, especially having uh, gone through the book, is, you know, to what extent is one owed flourishing from a profession in the current sort of economic status quo? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, how long have you got for to answer that question? Um, <laughs> we, you know, philosophers have been writing about flourishing and eudaimonia for you know a couple of thousand years at least, at least you know, officially writing about it in, in recorded history. I'm sure there's been longer discussions of it too. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I, I think like what it means to flourish as a human being is a richer notion than the critique that I just. Could briefly sketch there of teaching. So, oh, you know, there's a, um, I would say, kind of two schools of thought about what it means to to flourish in life. Uh, there's a kind of consequentialist school, I guess, where um, you know what it means to flourish is that you do certain things that are good for yourself and for the world around you. Another way of putting this is it's kind of a, an objectivist theory of of meaning, not in the sense of objectivism by Ayn Rand or anything like that, but just in the uh, kind of subjective objective distinction. So for me to live a meaningful life is for me to do things that uh, create objective value in the world around me. So I could improve the lives of other people, do morally good deeds. I could achieve some great kind of scientific insight or new knowledge or understanding of the world, or I could, um, you know, I guess produce some kind of, great work of art that that produces something that's objectively valuable. Uh, Alternatively, there's kind of subjectivist schools of thought when it comes to meaning in life that what what it means to live a a meaningful and flourishing life is just for you to feel really kind of satisfied and fulfilled by what you do, have a great sense of achievement, a sense of of purpose with what you do and satisfy your own desires and wants. But that can sound very selfish in practice. So, uh, most philosophers who think about what it means to flourish in life tend to kind of adopt a, what I would call a hybrid theory that it's it's a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. So you want to do things that are objectively valued, but you also want to do things that you are fulfilled by and find satisfying and, and find meaningful. Mm. And so, I mean, teaching is just a small part of of, of a life. You know, it's um, it's a small part of my life in a sense, right? I I work as an academic, so I do a lot of research and 
uh, kind of other admin and social contribution things in my job. And but I'm also, you know, I I have a family. I'm a father. Um, I have other interests outside of academia. So you know, these things are other sources of our potential sources of flourishing. So, so teaching is just one element that makes up the entire package. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, do you feel differently or is there teaching involved with raising a family? I'm probably too, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there is, but I'm probably a little <laughs> bit too early in the stages of, right. of fatherhood to, for that. I mean, so I'm a very young uh, mm. child, so um, only 20 months old. But I guess there's some kinds of education going on there. Well, I think of it because in some sense, the the stereotypical iconic teacher, you know, from Dead Poets Society or whatnot is certainly cast as the, you know, uh, ersatz father or something like this that um, has those sort of paternal role or at least can switch it on in the, in the right moment. And it has that kind of not... It it blends pedagogy with some sort of familial uh, responsibility. So this is kind of an interesting yeah. way of thinking about it. No, that's good. That's a good point. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I've I've written a bit as well on my blog about you know what, what's the meaning of parenting and um, like what kind of relationship should you have uh, as a parent to your to your children or how should you conceive of children. So like uh, one thing I I'm kind of opposed to is a an output oriented theory of parenting, which which is very common amongst I would say. And this is a cliche, but like, let's say, middle class, well-to-do parents is that they're hyper anxious that their children achieve the best kind of outcomes in life, that they have good jobs and good education. And this anxiety starts from a very early point. And one of the things that I'm trying to do, at least my own approach to parenting, is to not be so outcome oriented in my parenting and more, much more focused on the ongoing relationship between myself and my, my daughter in this instance, so that, you know, I, I, I can't perfectly control her life and hope that, you know, make turn her into, I don't know, some kind of Uber scholar or sports star or something like this, which, you know, parents often try to do with their children, but I can be there for her and, you know, be, be a shoulder to lean on and give her some kind of a guidance and assistance uh, without necessarily kind of forcing her in a, in a particular direction. But I mean, the, the point you make about the kind of overlap between the teacher student relationship and the parent child relationship is an interesting one. It's one that's, you know, frequently commented on by my peers. Um, I once had a colleague who said something to me that I found really bizarre which uh, and I've I've actually written about this as well in that piece that I wrote about parenting, that um, they said that uh, you know I should become a parent. I should have children because children are like the students that you get to follow throughout their entire lives, and it was um, such a kind of weird way of conceiving of right, the right. value of, of becoming a parent that I it's always stuck in my head. Uh, and like one thing as I would say is I don't. As a teacher, I don't ever really think of myself as occupying some kind of parental role. And and some uh, teachers would complain about the conflation or confusion of those different relationship styles. Something particularly true of women as teachers is that, and you know, my some of my female colleagues complain about this is that they're often put in the kind of motherhood role, and if they don't adopt this kind of mothering style of relationship to their students, they're often criticized for it. Um, so. I think there's a danger in conflating the two things, but it's true that in popular culture and literature, the the two things are often seen to overlap in some way. Right. Yeah. I don't have kids myself, so I'm just sort of guessing at what it must be like. But you know, one of the reasons I was so interested in speaking with you is that I used to teach at university and you know have a PhD and all that jazz, but now I teach almost <laughs> exclusively online. Uh, you know, because since the uh, lockdowns, I haven't done any live, um, you know, seminars or anything like this. But the both the article and then going and following up and reading your book, there seems to be this kind of middle ground where I feel like I have the utopia, uh, where you know I can just go make stuff, put it online, and you know, people will be taught or people will have access to some ed education and I'm not beholden to the hierarchy of a university, not beholden to, you know, sticking to any particular syllabus. I can go left, go right, go up, down, whatever, and so forth. 
But I do have this tyranny of metrics because I never see really anything other than what people report to me. And I see a dashboard that says how many views, how much percentage people watch through all of this. And it's automated. There's a, and there's, you know, a tremendous power and potential in it. But then at the same time, there's, you know, when we, when we think about, well, are these people actually flourishing? There's this reporting gap and then there's complaining gap and, I don't necessarily have a, a strict question here, but you know, one of the things that happened the other day on the community tab on the YouTube channel is I expressed a, a kind of oddity to the people following this. I made these exercises for you. Almost nobody gave me any feedback, and I said, you know, in order for me to um, continue making these crazy exercises based on Renaissance memory techniques from Giordano Bruno, you know, I gotta hear from you that you actually. Um, uh, use them and then what happens so we can refine this. And I didn't get any positive response other than people saying, you're so pushy and, uh, you know, why should you um, be complaining about us? And it, just this weird kind of response. Then I made a survey and I said, do you think that students, or sorry, do you think that online educators should be able to express their frustration with students? And 73% of people said yes. <laughs> so it's just kind of... Um, this weird thing, and I, I don't know how to conclude from it in your book, but it feels like there's a utopia, and yet it's not meaningless, but I don't have the sense of meaning. Rather, I just have stuff that's being put out, and then some people say, you helped me, and I just don't know whether that's true or not, you know? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, so well, there's a couple of things to say about that, and... Um, you know, we, they don't have to be strict questions here as well. Like, about, right, we right. can riff off each other's uh, experiences. Um, so, like, what I because the way I would frame it is that in the book that you're referring to, in automation and utopia, I kind of have this this multi dimensional theory of of human flourishing or meaningfulness, and right. um, you're you're probably scoring highly along some dimensions in terms in terms of you have a lot of autonomy and it's very much self driven, and you have the absence of those institutional constraints that that I would have teaching in a university but uh, at the other end of it uh, one of the advantages I guess to the extent there's an advantage of teaching in the university is that um, there's a kind of compulsion or forced uh, interaction you know students have to participate in your exercises otherwise they they can't uh, succeed. So it's maybe people have argued this is a negative side of teaching too, that there's kind of a coercive dimension to the, the teacher student relationship in universities that you have to do this or else yeah. something terrible will happen to you. Your <laughs> future will be foreclosed to you or something like that. Whereas the advantage from your perspective is that you're kind of getting students who are self-motivated or, you know, they're self-selecting this material. They're interested in this material. Um, or, you know, oftentimes I would get students who have to take my classes in order to graduate and have no particular interest in, in them. And kind of sustaining their engagement is often one of the, the major challenges. I, I would suspect that we're in landed in a somewhat similar epistemic fog when it comes to whether what we're doing is of value to them. Um, you know, like one, you know, one of the strange things I would say as a university lecturers that um, I, you know, I'd often mark student essays and give comments or critical feedback on them. And a lot of this is done online now through a you know, learning platform. So, you know, I'll get a digital copy of the student's essay and I, there's a little column that I can add my own comments or feedback and I can put little marks into the essay too at particular locations. So it's a much richer form of feedback that you can get than used to be the case when I was a student you know, less than 20 years ago, I guess it was, it was a college student in the early 2000s, you know, we were still in a situation where we would hand in paper essays and the lecturer or the or professor would leave them in a box outside their office. And you'd, if you wanted to, you'd have to take the trek down to their office and pick it up and read your, <laughs> read your feedback. And, and would typically be a couple of illegible scrawls on the side of the essay. So yeah, they're saying it's a, it's a much richer form of feedback that students get now. And and one of my modules, which I reference in the, the article, that uh, um, is the kind of premise for this this conversation. I I gave much more feedback than usual. I had, you know, I had about fifty students in this class, and every week I get them to do something, and I would give them feedback on it. 
uh, some of this was voluntary. It wasn't part of their final grade, and some of it was part of their final grade. Uh, what was interesting to me was that most students didn't do the voluntary exercises. You know, only about um, half of them did it. And one of my experiences with this kind of online feedback system is that unless you force them to do it, most students won't look at the feedback that they get either, right? Um, so what I found a couple of years ago was that there's a way of like releasing the grade that a student gets that they just, when they log into the online platform that we have, they just see their grade and they don't have to go into the feedback to see why they got that particular grade. They just see it. And when I had that system set up, no, like the majority of students didn't look at their feedback. They just looked at their grade and you, and you can record this. It's all metricized. You can see whether they've actually logged in to access their, their feedback or not. Right. But what I did now is that I basically insist, I don't release the grades through the platform anymore. I only include the grade as a comment at the bottom of their feedback. So they have to at least open the feedback and see the text that's there and scroll to the bottom of the text to see their grade. And all of a sudden, at least on the system, everyone's logging in to see right. you know, at least what grade they got. Um, so those are some of the kind of tricks I've had to adopt to kind of make sure that students take this kind of seriously. But, but I'm, again, I'm often, I'm often landed in a similar position to yourself as to, you know, do students find any of this useful? Mm. I almost never find out whether they do. Okay. I mean, there's two ways of finding out whether they do. One is that they volunteer this information in some other kind of interaction that you have. So, you know, very occasionally students will email me out of the blue to say that they really liked a particular class or it'll come up in the course of some other conversation or alternatively you can ask them whether they got something out of it uh, and you can do that through kind of formal surveys as, as you were doing there or informally and there i have colleagues of mine who will you know talk to students after class and ask whether they found this useful or not I, maybe it's just my personality but i I can't bring myself to do that because it sounds sort of needy or desperate that you need to know whether the students liked you or liked your, your class in some way. And so that's, that's a personality defect of mine maybe, but um, I'm very reluctant to go down in that particular route. So I tend to only rely on, I guess, serendipity or pure contingency of a student happening to mention it to me or these formalized feedback surveys and as you know, in the piece I wrote, there's a very long critique of formalized feedback surveys as to whether they are actually valuable information, right? Yeah, I can't, uh, from my university years, I can't remember learning anything other than that I was vaguely entertaining and scruffy, long-haired, you know, person who should have had a better coat or something like they would, it, it would just be yeah, they, this binary opposite between empty praise or, you know, some fickle criticism of appearance uh, on the, the feedback that I got at university. Yeah, no, I mean, similar experiences to that as well. Yeah. Mind you. Were you entertaining or were you, <laughs> um, they didn't like you in some way. They found you, I mean, in my case, a lot of people find me boring. Um, well, I find my voice boring anyway. So that's something that I, I get feedback on constantly. I wonder, though, I mean... I don't know that the, I don't know what the alternative is to the current education system, but it seems it seems to me that there's and you start the article with a kind of example of how it works or how it can work in terms of inspiration or someone having a, an outcome. And when I when I think of my own success, I mean I have one it's one student right, but it's it's significant. He. Uh, went uh, in my film courses, and he then decided to become a film scholar. Next thing you know, he's got all kinds of publications. He's done his PhD now. Now he's got a great job at a, a, a film, basically museum archive theater in Hamburg. And it's just, that's the best possible outcome, you know? Some stuff that I said about film studies creates a passion and a career from somebody who was thinking about doing archaeology when, when we met. Um, so there's that. And then I have my own story with that, you know, where without getting into it, somebody says something and the next thing you know, I'm getting a PhD and et cetera, et cetera. So do you, um, think those are just, you know, isolated incidents that we psychologically 
put more emphasis on because of our own personal pattern recognition? Or is that the real function of school uh, overall in history? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so well, I guess there's well, one thing to, to say here is that and the, the other people that have actually written responses to this article that I've, I've uh, that I wrote that I, some of them are quite interesting and thoughtful. So Marcus Arvin, who runs a blog called the Philosopher's Cocoon, has written an interesting piece on this. And I guess one of the themes that emerges from his discussion is that he agrees with me in a, a lot of the critiques that I have of of teaching and whether we have the knowledge or know whether teaching is meaningful and the the institutional frustrations associated with teaching. But um, he kind of says, well, is it, is it enough? It, it may well be true that you don't reach most students, that the vast majority of them, your teaching makes no difference to, to their life in any way. Is it enough that you make a difference to one student, like as you're mentioning here, or, or a handful of students? And is that enough to kind of keep you going? And I suppose I, you know, reflecting on that criticism of my piece, and he gives examples of particular teachers that have made a profound impact on his life and um, potential, you know, students that he seems to have made a kind of difference to. And I, I suppose I haven't ever really, well, sorry, I have, I have thought about that. And uh, as one thing I'm concerned about as well, what's the hit rate of teaching then? You know, is it enough that like one in a thousand of my students found my classes, um, you know, to, to make this big difference to their life. Like they were heading in one direction and they went in a different direction. Um, and uh, is that enough? But even if it is enough, so even if and even if I do have that one example, let's say, my innate your critical attitude is that okay, was I really the one that made the difference in life? And I, like, I do have some students who contacted me over the years who say that classes I've taught them have made a, a difference. And there's probably a couple I can think of here that have write back to me and kind of value the interactions that we've had and the, the feedback that I've given them. And, I, and you know, there are certain students that I have helped to win scholarships or publish pieces and things like that. I, I certainly get a, a kick out of that. But I, I tend to think that a lot of those students would have succeeded anyway without me per se and I'm not, I'm not sure if i'm the one who's made the critical difference to their life and also i guess and in, a, in a kind of odd contradiction to the whole premise of of my initial critique of teaching i'm kind of sometimes i'm a little bit worried that i might make such a difference to somebody's life okay, okay. <laughs> um so i mean the your film stu studies student as an example well, you know, would it, would the, the student have been better off if they went down a different path in life or they did something else? Am I, am I necessarily making a positive? I might be making a difference to their life, but is it really a positive difference uh, to their life? And I guess what, like, just one other point to make about this is that uh, even when we do have those individual stories of students who seem to have been influenced by what we've done, and um, and it's nice to have them and kind of latch onto them. And th this is something I bring up in the article. It often makes me wonder, what about all the other students who aren't contacting me, who I might have influenced in some way, in a negative way? You know, was there some student who I uh, I taught and they were really keen on doing something, and but my classes convinced them that they just weren't cut out for it or they didn't have the ability or something like that? Mm. Maybe falsely, maybe falsely gave them this sort of negative feedback and... I just never learn about that. I never find out about that. Right. Now, again, that's that's me being overly critical and maybe overly negative in my reasoning about it. But I, I do wonder about that sometimes. Yeah, well, it seems either way that you spin it, not totally, but part of the problem is the ego of the individual. And, you know, because when we think about the positive, possible negative connotations, then we wouldn't want to take responsibility for that. But we've seen court cases like with Judas Priest or whatever, they can't possibly take responsibility for kids reading satanic messages out of it. It's just songs, you know. And um, likewise, could Judas Priest really take responsibility for all the joy that I've had? Well, no, because they are embedded in endless series of guitar manufacturing historical you know evolution and drums and you know what 
the history of language like are you going to thank shakespeare you know it's just kind of um yeah yeah it's we, I suppose we can get at some level yeah we, we can <laughs> if we're overly critical and it can kind of get a bit silly in a sense and mm. that yeah and that there's certainly a deeper philosophical conversation to be had as to whether any of us can ever really take responsibility for anything or be fully blamed for anything as well you know right, right. um i mean this is a, something i experienced on a much more uh, kind of personal level, I would say. So, you know, another aspect of university teaching is one the, one kind of teaching you do is like to very large classes. And I, I think that's often the most difficult kind of teaching, right? Um, when you're teaching hundreds of students in a lecture theater and you, you pretty much have no personal interaction or connection with any of them. They're just faces in a crowd. Or for the past year when we've been teaching, it's been... You know, I, I've been speaking into a void, into literally a void, and that no, you know, no students put on their cameras to look back at me through mm -hmm. Skype or Zoom or whatever platform we're using. So I'm just talking to myself for an hour or so. Um, but I, I, every year I do that anyway to some extent, but it's in a lecture theater with hundreds of faces in front of me. And then there's other kinds of things like we do more mentoring and supervision type teaching, let's say with research students or students doing PhDs. And, and so, uh, some people would argue that those are the most meaningful forms of education for them. Like uh, Colleagues of mine would, would reflect on this. It's really their PhD students that they derive the most sort of value and sense of purpose from. But, but that comes with a catch of that. It's also like the one that you have to take more personal responsibility for and and this is an issue that you know a lot of students struggle doing research degrees and they struggle to finish their dissertations or they struggle to get employment afterwards and because of the relative intimacy of that relationship like the or intimacy is the wrong choice of words here i say cl relative closeness of that relationship you're much more personally involved in both their successes and failures so it has both a positive dimension and a negative dimension to it. But the, in a sense, that's a feature of any meaningful human relationship, I suppose, you know, that uh, the best kinds of relationships are often those with the highest reward, but also the highest risk right. uh, of loss associated with them too, you know? Well, that's interesting. I mean, given the debt that so many, I don't know what it's like, uh, with uh with where you're teaching uh, and in that country not as bad but yeah you know the debt in canada was not as bad as the u.s but i've taught in all three all countries i've taught in germany uh, canada and the u.s and the stakes that were the highest in the united states and that was where i had the least amount of sense that anybody felt the stakes you know it was just the most throwaway thing you could imagine coming to my courses and, and so forth when i taught in the states so yeah i wonder um i mean it, it sort of comes back to at least how, how i'm interpreting what you said that there's something about the individual um that that the student brings and you know, they are the ones who end up doing it, seeking if they're seekers and, you know, taking action if they're action takers and so forth. And so it just feels like it's just a giant sort of pinball machine. So is is having a stake in it really what's at stake or is this it? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Is it one feels so controversial to raise words like DNA and <laughs> that sort of stuff, but yet it seems like an implication of this is that there may be um, something to all of that in terms of how performance is distributed, regardless of what social institution you, you put it through. Hierarchies form, um, or they seem to form, uh, and performance just sort of plays out according to some pair two distribution principle or Price's Law or something like this, that just the, the, the field separates itself regardless of how the institution is structured. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that, that you don't have to latch on to any like particular causal determined as being like DNA or or hereditary and things being the most significant contributors. There's, pro there's probably a variety of them. It's it's interesting that um, as you were saying, so you have kind of a natural experiment to draw upon here that you've taught in in three different jurisdictions where, mm. yeah, yeah, like the you know simplistic economics 101 
reasoning would be that if if there's a financial stake attached to the education that students are paying for this as a service kind of consumer type relationship, they're going to be more switched on or engaged or whatever the case may be. Um, and yet practice suggests that that's not really or entirely the case. It, it, that I mean, I taught in the UK for a number of years and I guess they had only recently introduced their more onerous fee system when I was there, but certainly I didn't notice that there was anything different or distinct about the students that I, that I taught. They weren't more clued in. So, some of them would occasionally cite or mention the fact that they had, they were paying these fees and this was a reason for you to give more of your personal time to them or something like that. Yeah. But that was a relatively rare phenomenon. Um, because I think the reality is that for most students who are relatively young adults, okay, the majority of them are, um, they don't really think about those costs because uh, they're they're not costs that they're likely to pay up front. They're not things that they're paying right now in many cases. Uh, they're things that might mature in years to come. Um, and uh, I mean, when it comes to the question of kind of self-motivation or the distribution of talent and things of that, I think um, I think the, re- the 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 I think the problem is that I'm I'm an optimist in the sense that I think most people have something that they are passionate about and will be motivated to pursue but i am pessimist in the sense that it's not nec- it's unlikely to be the thing that i'm teaching them right <laughs> it, that's going to be something that appeals to a few people out there and at least in in my case you know since i teach in a law school a lot of students end up doing my degree as a fallback option because they don't they're not really sure what they want to do but they want to please their parents that they're doing something with a kind of professional orientation but it's not you know their their passion is is music or their passion is um you know kind of entrepreneurship or something like this but they've they're trying to go on this safe pathway um yeah that was kind of a a rambling answer but yeah well yeah i mean i i think that 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 is a good lens to to start to look at it um if we were to think of your own education you know, I'm I'm an admirer of people who write well, and not a person prone to envy. But when I was reading both your article and your book, I'm just thinking, man, this is really good writing, um, and the, the the clarity of thought, which may come from both a legal and uh, philosophical background and training that I don't have, uh, you know, maybe part of that. But what what do you attribute? your learning of being able to write, being able to get a, you know, the degrees that lead to this kind of career. Um, if you, if you do some self reflection and analysis, w- was that taught or is it an inclination and a passion that you had that just basically teaches you on autopilot through practice or how do you, how do you see that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, and uh, you know, it's very it's very hard for me to kind of piece together my own life or come up with some grand unified theory of my own life as to uh, <laughs> why I've ended up where I where I am. So, one of the things I do comment on in in the piece is that I don't ever I I've never really had a teacher or individual that I can think of that you know inspired me to to go down a certain route. Um, so this, uh, there's another academic, um, Amiya Srinivasan, who wrote wrote a piece about teacher student relationships that I found interesting but I had a comment within this essay that she wrote that you know every every academic that I know of has a teacher story and that they had they have one person who awakened the passion for the world of ideas within them and that's why they've ended up in their career and that's why most academics aspire to do the same for their students right. and I, when I read that I was like well that's that's interesting insofar as that doesn't really speak to my own personal experience. I can't think of any single individual or teacher who did such a thing for me. Uh, the only example I can think of that's like that is a negative example, right? Which is um, a, a teacher I had in in our you know, pr- a primary school, as we call it here, um, who who was a very interesting teacher who one thing I liked about his approach was that he, it was a very eclectic style and would get us to write essays from lots of different perspectives, you know. And I, I have looked back at my old copy books and read some of the essays that I wrote for his classes and 
I, I found them interesting. And, you know, there, there were things in there that you would undoubtedly, as a teacher, get canceled for nowadays. Because so, I remember one thing was that we were learning about the suffragette movement, right? And he he asked us to write a letter to the, the Times newspaper in London uh, as, from the perspective of somebody who was opposed to the suffragette movement. Kind of like a debate class exercise, but kind of anti, basically, the women's vote. Um, so almost certainly would end up being cancelled if this was an exercise done in like 2021. Um, but the, he had lots of those kinds of exercises, which I did find useful from a writing perspective. But ironically, the one thing that always sticks in my head about that teacher is something that he said to my parents, my mother in particular, in a teacher meeting, teacher student meeting, which um, was that, and maybe you're getting a sense of this in this conversation, which is that that I was um, a very arrogant student, and that I needed to have some kind of knock or setback in life to put me kind of on the on the straight and narrow. And that's the thing that lodges in my head about that teacher. So, right. uh, so it's kind of a quite a sort of like a negative memory of it, uh, of of that experience. You know, as to as to why I've ended up where I am, I'm. I think a lot of it was probably family. Uh, you know, I had. Like, why am I interested in philosophy? Because I've never taken a class in philosophy, right? And to some extent, my research and writing is almost entirely philosophical even though i teach in a law school and, and law is my educational background my perspective on legal issues is very much a, a philosophical one and, and a lot of what i do is you know not even really tangentially re related to law it's hard to justify it in that sense um well one reason why i probably am interested in it is because my brother studied philosophy in university and when i was a teenager i used to read some of the books that he would have lying around. Um, so, yeah, wh one thing, I'm kind of entirely self-taught in philosophy and self-motivated in that sense. And, and that's one reason why I probably find it quite interesting and inspiring is because it's, it's a thing that I've always kind of done for myself. And it's almost a point of pride with me that I've never taken a class in it, right? Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> And it's something that you know people often mention to me that they'll say, "Oh, you know, um, oh, you know where, where did you do your kind of philosophy degree?" Or these are kind of professional peers will comment on these things to me, and I'll just say, "Well, I'm actually I'm not not a philosopher. I never never taken a philosophy class, even though that's what I'm probably known for within the academic community." Um, and that has always just been a kind of intrinsic fascination with philosophical questions and a, a philosophical state of mind. You know, I remember um, when I was a young child sitting in, in church, when I used to go to church, that reflecting on um, the, what, you know, what, what would come after the end of the universe. You know, like, is there such a thing as an end to the universe? You know, okay, if we all go to heaven, does that come to an end as well? Like, you know, and what happens then? Is everything necessarily kind of bound up in some sort of temporal order, uh, or is it? Is there such a thing as like eternity or a kind of non-temporal existence? I remember having that thought when I was—I must have been about nine or ten—in um, in church one day, uh, and so I'm kind of naturally drawn to those kinds of questions and reflections. And I, I don't have a, a deep explanation for it, uh, or a, a single event that would have caused it. It's probably a a concatenation of events that are responsible for it. Sorry, that was, a, again, another long no, it, discussion. It, it, yeah. It's interesting, and it, it kind of brings me to a thought about automation and utopia, because I wasn't thinking about it when I read it, but just to test this with you, see if it if it makes any sense. It seems to me that some of the, you know, the granular details that you get into have a lot to do with with will, you know, things being against our will and that being kind of the real issue because we have to do things we don't want to do in order to even try to flourish <laughs> in a, you know, market economy that is just, you know, it's grind. It's, it's growth oriented. If it's not growing, you know, it's dying, that kind of logic. And um, it just seems to be excess accumulation of wealth with no way to appropriately spend it 
assuming you even have it to, you know, I'm thinking of Bataille a little bit here, um, uh, you know, with his um, gross expenditure that you can't, you can never spend it appropriately, assuming you even have that. And so there's just like multiple ways that everything is against our will. And yet at the same time, the, the, the notion of what we're talking about seems to suggest a kind of absence of will. Well, we just wound up this way. It might be this influence. It might be that influence. We don't ultimately know. It's just a story that we can tell to kind of patch together how we, how we got here. So I wonder how free will ties into, you know, the promise of, of a uh, more automation that would free us from work and then what mm. would we what would we do if we didn't have the pinball machine of the world, you know, just bumping us into different directions? Because it seems to me one of the implications of more automation is more control and dictation of what one does and where one lands, and not less. Um, not that you're saying that in the book, but that seems to me, if we do the exponential, uh, you know, calculations on what it could be, it seems like there's a high risk that one is going to be automated, not, uh, not, you know, in, uh, in the culmination of, of a utopia on the other end of automation. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, one, one paper I wrote years ago called the, the threat of algocracy was about this kind of governance by algorithms, but, you know, AI and robotics that this is one possible outcome that we're in this sort of automated slavery and, and just to, kind of throw that that concept out there and something I, t I talk about a bit in the book um as to you know you know tying it back to the biographical question about why i'm interested in things that i do or whatever um i, I guess there's a distinction to be made when it comes to how we think about the will and how we will things between let's say the ultimate origin of a something and maybe the concurrent or contemporaneous origin of something so it, in my day-to-day -day experience of my life I I still seem like I am relatively willful or in control of certain things that I do, and so if I if I write this article about whether teaching is is meaningful, that's an idea that I had and a set of thoughts that I had, and I can whip them into shape to make them somehow coherent and logical, and that seemed like a me exercising my autonomy and control over this idea that is kind of spontaneous or not necessarily spontaneously, but emerged and bubbled up into my consciousness at some point in a time I couldn't let go of it. And once it bubbled up into my consciousness, I acted using my control, my autonomy to produce this, this article. So that, that particular episode in my life seems like it's something that I had some level of control over, but the, the origin of it, you know, why I, why this thing bubbled up into my consciousness, the roots of my, philosophical temperament, why I'm interested in the questions that I'm interested in, those things are much more obscure and the notion that I have control over the ultimate origination of things is, I think, more more dubious, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. When, it, when it comes back to, to automation then, though, I, I think a major concern or fear we should have about automation, particularly in the modern era, is the the sense that the the technological infrastructure that is supposedly freeing us up from doing certain things like having the drudgery of certain forms of of labor, let's say, um, that is under the control of more and more kind of centralized groups or relatively few corporate and governmental actors. And so that can create this kind of automated control system. It's much easier to monitor and manipulate people. And that's certainly a, a concern that we should have about this technosphere that we are in the midst of creating. Right. Yeah. I mean, who knows where all that's going to go? But it, I, I love the the promise there, um, and you know, I don't. I don't. I, I just don't know what it's going to do for education and I, the automation of education concerns me a little bit, but maybe it's not automation isn't the right word, but it seems to me that everything's okay. Like students are still learning and, and so forth, but I'm finding a little bit of um, a lack of continuity 
that may be a good thing because we do have some studies in memory that, you know, interleaving helps people learn more faster because they're on and off and switching and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know that it's sort of helping with greater distribution or uh, a kind of way of figuring out what it is that helps some people have initiative and passion and drive and others just not. And so I wonder if you see potential in automation or how education is going to, I don't even know how to, how to structure it, but, you know, help people, help people find whatever that is, that, that missing ingredient that some s seem to have through luck, fortune, <laughs> chance, fate, whatever it is, uh, so that, that, that they can participate in whatever's coming and be part of making what's coming great rather than potentially the risky outcome it could be. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a couple of ways to to reflect on that. Um, one thing is, so there's a definition of teaching that I have in, in the article that I wrote early on. It's from a literature professor who wrote this book about the art of teaching, I think it's back in the early 2000s, but I've, I often refer to it, which is that, you know, that the purpose of education is to awaken a student to their true potential. Um, that was, that's one element of, of the definition that he, that he has. And I think there are reasons to be optimistic about the role of technology and education when it comes to awakening people to their potential um, in, in the sense that um, there is now more kind of educational content out there than ever before, right? And the, the kinds of things that you're doing kind of outside the traditional educational institutions and there's other there's many other examples i guess things like the Khan academy would be another sort of famous illustration of this that, that if you if you are motivated and you want to learn something you can there are, the means are available to you at very low cost at the moment right so if if you are really interested in the, let's say some aspect of philosophy like the philosophy of free will just to pick up on the right. last question you can learn about that really easily now. You can you can probably contact people like me or others around the world. You can interact with people directly to discuss these questions with. If you're motivated, if that's what piques your curiosity, you can do it in a way that you could never have done before. And, and in a sense, I find that in my own life, and that you know, day to day, I get the opportunity to explore interesting questions and kind of self-educate myself on them. So to the extent the the article that I wrote about teaching was an exercise is in self-education and that I was, I was interested in, you know, is teaching meaningful? What does the research say on the retention, whether students learn critical thinking skills, whether feedback surveys is meaningful? I got to research that question and find out about all of those things in a, cu a couple of days because of the technology that's available to us. So, it, it's easy to kind of like explore a very vast landscape of knowledge, find the thing that you're aware that is your thing that fascinates you, the question that interests you, and learn about it. So that those are reasons to be optimistic. And I suppose for you know yourself and um, people who are educational innovators, uh, that's also a, a cause for optimism that you can kind of work within that space and and help people who are trying to navigate this vast landscape of knowledge. I mean, there's also reasons to be pessimistic, though, I think, about it, right? Um, th there's the impact of technology on cognitive function, something I talk a little bit about in, in Automation and Utopia as well, but, you know, the, the impact of the collapse of attention or the manipulation or capturing of attention by services. Is it degrading our capacity to pay attention to things? Is it fragmenting our attention? Are we being absorbed by trivial things? You know, does, does social media exaggerate hot emotions like anger and scorn or disgust? And it's not a good thing to spend all your time absorbed with those kinds of things. And that, that takes us away from the values of, of education and the positive side of things. So there's reasons to be pessimistic in that sense. So so that's that's one kind of layer of the question Another layer is, you know, when it comes to the economy, and if we think about education in terms of its value to students who want to enter the workplace, I think there's more of a challenge there, right, when it comes to technology. And, you know, one of the books that I, I cite in, in the article is Brian Kaplan's book, The Case Against Education, which 
he wrote a couple of years ago and generated a lot of furore. But, um, you know, his main theory is that the value of education is not so much in the knowledge that you learn. I mean, most of the things that you need for work, you learn on the job. You learn through the process of working. Education is valuable as kind of signaling thing, right? It's to signal to potential employers that you would be a good employee, that you've kind of worked through the drudgery of four years of higher education. You you can submit things on time. You can organize your calendar. You can network with people. You can do whatever it is. It, it's kind of signaling this package of information to employers that would be very difficult for them to find out otherwise. And if we if, if that's the tr- that's the purpose of education or higher education, it's the signaling effect. Then, as the space of employment and opportunities reduces through automation, it's likely that the competition for better signals will heat up, and so education will become an ever more competitive space from both educators' perspectives and students' perspectives. And this is likely t- to or it seems plausible to me this will exacerbate the kind of crisis of anxiety and mental health issues that we are seeing now amongst the modern kind of student population. And something that I I have noticed, and th- I, this is anecdotal, but it also seems to be backed up by the data. I've noticed this even in the short period of time that I have been teaching in higher education. So, you know, a decade or so teaching in higher education, the, the numbers of students presenting with mental health issues with increased anxiety, with the, with the sense that their life will be a failure if they don't get an A-type grade in their exams is through the roof now. I mean, it, I just, it, it's almost hard to hard to believe. And that, that's another kind of negative impact of automation potentially on, on the um, education space. Well, with that in mind, I know it's getting late there for you, and uh, I think we could probably talk th- two more hours just about the uh, the mental health implications, which I have uh, experiences with myself. But um, you know, in, by way of wrapping up, uh, where can people find you? What's coming up next for you? And you know, I don't want to be trite or anything, but if you could just boil things down to what would you suggest to teachers if there was one thing that they could do to perhaps get more meaning out of the situation that they're in? And what would you suggest to students that they might do to be more meaningful to themselves, but perhaps if they're so willing and charitable to actually create more meaning for their teachers? Yeah, I mean, I guess from a teacher's perspective, I would say, you know, maybe... And it's hard to do this, but like to the extent that it's possible, try to avoid playing the kind of inst- the game that a lot of educational institutions want you to play, which is to um, measure your self worth by kind of positive comments on on student feedback or things like that, and, and um, or, or to, and also to have like an, maybe an overly outcome oriented view of teaching as well. That the value of teaching lies in improving grades or improving outcomes for students, because it's very hard to track and determine whether you are responsible for that. So I would say that you should try and kind of double down on the things that you are interested in and fascinated in and try to convey that passion and engagement in your teaching um, and, and try and kind of forge interesting experiences for students in the classroom on a daily basis. And, you know, it's, as I say, it's easier said than done. It's easy for me to say these things. I find it harder to do these things in practice. But that's something I, I do try to do is to just focus on teaching as a kind of experience, a day-to-day experience, as opposed to a set of outcomes that I might never know anything about. Right. Um, yeah. From a student's perspective, I guess, you know, one thing is if they're so inclined, they and or they should maybe think about um, answer, you know, providing feedback to to teachers voluntarily without you know the the feedback survey or form being the the way in which they they do this uh, it, yeah not everyone's comfortable doing that and i i fully appreciate why that mightn't be but it's always nice and yeah, it's nice when people email me to say that they've read something i wrote and that they liked it as you did actually before when you invited me to this conversation because most of the time it just it does feel like i'm posting things on a a notice board that most people aren't looking at, right? Right. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like 
when you can have the opening of a discourse or an opening of a conversation that is itself enriching or enlivening and, and has has the outcome that you can't ever force but it's 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 edifying when it when it arrives so very grateful to be able to spend this time and um, where can people find you if they want to learn more and uh, any new books coming out that you're working on uh, yeah, so I, I'm on Twitter at John Danaher, the uh, the original John Danaher. Uh, there's a very famous uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor who's been profiled in the New Yorker right. with the same name as me. But <laughs> I'm not him. Let's not say that. And I, I have this blog where the, this article is found, which is Philosophical Disquisitions, kind of long-winded title. Um, uh, so you can just put, put that into Google and you'll find find me um and i i have a book automation utopia as you mentioned i have another book just co-authored this year called a citizen's guide to artificial intelligence that's sort of that, again that's the area i typically work in which is technology and ethics and law cool well i'm gonna have all the links for those and again i appreciate your time so much and thank you for writing that article i found it you know both resonating with something that i've thought about i thought some of the reactions were interesting as well and it kind of just reminded me of you know some of those checkmate kind of philosophical texts like david benatar's better never to have been it's just kind of like yeah no argument here but you'll just want to hear you know a little bit more about what that is so i really appreciate the time yeah th thanks for that and I, I i don't think that what i've written some kind of like definitive critique of <laughs> the meaningfulness of teaching and as i mentioned in the in the post i'd like people to push back against me and and there have been a couple of i think thoughtful responses to what i've written as well um yeah. that i've liked that i've learned from absolutely and you know i look forward to the next one and and uh really appreciate the time cheers thanks anthony <laughs>